Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Proctor from the National Student Attendance, Engagement, and Success Center. Welcome to today's session, building a multi-tiered and multi-sector response to chronic absenteeism at state and district levels. Please allow me to share some brief details about today's session. We will share a presentation by Dr. Bob Balfant from the National Student Attendance, Engagement, and Success Center. Dr. Balfant is a research professor at the Center for the Social Organization of Schools at Johns Hopkins University School of Education, where he's co-director of the Talent Development Secondary Reform Model and director of the Everyone Graduate Center. He focuses on translating research findings into effective school interventions. In 2013, he was named a champion for change for African American education by the White House. Today's session will last for approximately 60 minutes and is being recorded. We will be placing everyone on mute. Please do not unmute yourself. At the end of the presentation, we will play a video of pre-recorded responses to a few pre-submitted questions. After, we will have time for a live Q&A with Linda Mus Muskowski from the Everyone Graduate Center. If you have any questions or comments, please log them into the chat function on the right side of the screen. Any unanswered questions will be answered via email within the next couple weeks. Before we begin the presentation, I want to share with you the mission of the National Center. The mission of the Center is to disseminate evidence-based practices and build and facilitate communities of practice to help students attend every day, be engaged in school, and succeed academically so that they graduate high school prepared for college, career, and civic life. Now we'll watch Bob's presentation. Welcome to Breakout Session 8, a multi-tiered, multi-sector approach to chronic absenteeism. I'm Robert Balfance from the National Student Attendance, Engagement, and Success Center. At the heart of a multi-tiered, multi-sector response to chronic absenteeism are the three key building blocks of addressing chronic absenteeism. And the first is the measuring. You need to measure chronic absenteeism at the district, school, and grade level in as close to real time as possible. In addition, if we're using a set number of days for accountability, some places it's if you miss 15 days, some places if you miss 18 days, you're just considered chronically absent. We also need to measure who's missing 10% of school at any time. This really enables us to take a prevention approach and rapid intervention. We don't want to wait to the end of the year to see that the student has missed 18 days to do something. We want to know in November or October or the end of September how many kids are on track to be chronic absent. We can only do that if we're tracking how many kids at any given time have missed 10% of the school year to date. This lets us identify students who are chronically absent and trending towards it. The next building block after we measure is the monitor. On at least a bi-weekly basis, we need to be examining chronic absenteeism trends and patterns at the district, school, and grade level. So we want to be tracking individual kids to know who we need to intervene with, we also want to be looking at trends and patterns to find the most strategic point of intervention. And that's critical to a multi-tiered, multi-sector uh, intervention system, which is always asking, what is the most strategic level I can intervene? If we see through trends and patterns that multiple students have the same problem, it's much easier to often address that at a more systematic level than kid by kid by kid. And then on an annual basis, we should conduct surveys to really understand the key drivers of chronic absenteeism at the district and school level. How much of it is it things keeping kids out of school? How much is it, is it kids avoiding things at school? How much of it is disengagement? How much of it is parental misunderstanding of the importance of attendance? That can change from year to year and vary from place to place. So that's why it's very important for districts to do their annual surveys to get a deeper understanding of why kids aren't coming to school on a regular basis. After we've measured and monitored, it doesn't do any good if we don't act. So the third key component of this effort is really to act upon the data we're measuring and monitoring. So we need to build a prevention and intervention system that's appropriate for the scale and intensity of the chronic absenteeism we have found. We need to build relationships with students and families with prior histories of chronic absenteeism and those just trending towards it so we can get that deep understanding of root causes. If we don't understand root causes, 
It's very possible that our intervention and prevention strategies will be wrong and misaligned and can even make things worse, not better. And as we're going to see in more detail in a minute, we need to take a multi-sector approach um, when we find an underlying issue that's from outside of school uh, that's driving a lot of the chronic absenteeism. And finally, we have to make school a welcoming place for students and parents and take a problem-solving, not a punitive approach to chronic absenteeism. We want all students and all parents to know they're wanted and desired in school every day. And if they can't make it, we want to help solve the problem that's standing in their way. We don't want to make them feel bad because they missed the day of school. We don't want to make them feel like we're going to try to get them in trouble. We want to make them feel like we want them there. We want to understand what's keeping them, what's keeping them from being there. And we want to work with them to solve that problem. Once we've done our measuring and our monitoring, we're going to almost always understand that why we want a multi-sector response. We'll see that it's not just a school or parent issue. We will see that there are issues clearly related to schools. And there are maybe some issues related to parental misunderstanding or struggles they have with, um, with just being able to find the transportation or the, the means for their students to be in school every day or their concerns about safety. But we're going to find a lot of other things that have to do with the health and safety and housing and the environment of the community and transportation issues. And we're going to see that there's a good number of kids that are not coming to school on a regular basis because they have very complicated or very insufficient transportation available to do it. If they miss one bus, it's a 45-minute wait for the next bus. If it's raining, there's no way to give them the rain gear they need not to get soaked. We're going to find places where there's untreated asthma or untreated, uh, untreated other diseases that are fully preventable and fully manageable, but the basic uh, ability to do that is lacking in the school or the community. We're going to find safety issues. We're going to find housing issues where kids aren't sleeping well because of substandard housing that's cold, that's hot, um, that's, that's got other issues that makes it very uncomfortable to get a night's rest, which then leads them to sleeping late and not being at school. So that's really why multi-sector is key to this. It's not just a school issue. It's not just a parent issue. There are many things in the community that prevent kids from coming to school on a regular basis, particularly when these are communities of, that, have, that live in poverty. Um, and with each of these efforts, there are exemplary effort, with each of these sectors, there are exemplary efforts to work with schools and communities to reduce chronic absenteeism. Uh, the sort of American Public Health Associations have done a lot of work. The nursing associations have done a lot of work. The public housing authorities have done a lot of work. Um, you can look at New York City as a place where they've pulled this all together, um, as well as uh, some other, other areas that have been mentioned throughout this virtual convening. The next thing we have to do to take this sort of multi-sector, multi-tiered response is figuring out how we're going to, that each school is not the same, both within the district and within the school. We have to organize ourselves in different ways depending on the level of intensity of chronic absenteeism we have found in our measuring and monitoring. So to act appropriately, we have to have the right resources amassed against the right scale of the problem. To that, it takes strategic analysis. We have to look across the district and we'll almost inevitably find that a subset of schools have very high rates, another subset have modest rates, another subset have pretty decent rates, and in each of those we need a different strategy and a different level of resourcing, and a different level of attention, um, and a different level of effort. And so the district level, it's really important to understand what are your school level patterns of chronic absenteeism, and really by grade, so you can really align the right resources in the right place um, in the right way. At the school level, the number of kids who are chronically absent really helps determine how we organize an effort against it. If there's 30 or fewer kids chronically absent, often a student support team can lead this effort team of three or four or five or six adults, pulling in others is necessary. That's the right scale. That number of adults can manage about 30 students in a fairly direct way. If it's closer to 50, we're going to have to start getting our teachers involved. There's just too many kids in need of strong relationships to be leveraged, understand the root causes, and, and need to be welcomed by an adult and feel supported in school for a small team to do it alone. When I get to this level, the whole school has got to be involved. The teachers have got to be in the game. And it's got to be an organized effort. And we get over 70 kids. And remember, some of our schools have 100, 200, 300 kids chronically absent. But when we get over 70 or above, it's often the time we have to bring community partners in to provide that additional person power. So beyond the, the support team, beyond the teachers, once we get to a certain scale, we have to bring in the community, have them play a role as mentors, 
have them play a role as student support providers, have them play a role as youth service connectors, but we have to increase the person power when we get above 70, 100 kids being chronically absent. In high need schools and districts, there's no way we'll succeed without a multi-tiered system. The first tier is the universal, the prevention tier. It basically says we want to make school a welcoming place. We want to make parents feel welcome there. We want to be closely monitoring our data. We want to recognize good and improved attendance, really through social recognition. It doesn't always have to be physical incentives. They, have, they work sometimes. They don't other times. But almost there's no kid that doesn't want to be socially recognized for good behavior and good outcomes in school. We've seen some of the, some of the kids that look like the hardest kids on the outside positively break down when they got recognized, often saying it's one of the few times they've been recognized for anything in their lives. So upfront recognition for attendance and improvement, making school a welcoming, engaging place, reaching out to kids and families to make them feel wanted, and then really identifying those common barriers that, meet, that affect many kids and solving them in a proactive way. Make sure there's transportation. Make sure there's a system for when it's raining. Make sure that, that there's ways to navigate unsafe neighborhoods if they exist through various kinds of community walking campaigns and things like that. That's our tier one. Almost every school should do that. And especially at high need schools, if we don't do that level, we will overwhelm our next two levels. We can't individually intervene our way out of chronic absenteeism when it's at a high number. We have to have strong upfront prevention first. The next tier is, the, is tier two. That's for kids that need some sort of direct adult contact on a regularly reoccurring basis. This idea of that caring adult relationship. You've heard about success mentors in, uh, in other sessions in this virtual convening. That's a growing effort to kind of create those, those caring adults at scale that work in the schools, form a direct relationship with students that have a history of chronic absenteeism or have just become it, leverage that relationship to other underlying root causes, share that with sort of school data teams that can systematically analyze that data, but be there every day to welcome that kid in school or most days of the week to encourage them to make them feel wanted, and to really start doing that micro problem solving for when they just need the alarm clock to be woken up on time, when they just need some small changes to make big impacts, then you can directly do those. And then also when it becomes a bigger issue, you can more rapidly refer the kids to the help they need. And then finally, if those things, for the kids, these tiers don't work, we need that final third tier, that really coordinated uh, youth service agencies in the school, the rapid referrals, sort of case managed, for kids whose out-of-school problems are so great until we solve them, it's not going to matter that everything else we did. We have to do the direct problem solving when it is a health issue or when it is a housing issue or when it is you know, a safety issue. Um, and also, you know, in, in some rare cases, we often the legal system gets involved. That's really only been shown effective when it's been able to see that the parents are the ones actively keeping the kids out of school. Um, in those situations, courts can be effective, but that's actually a relatively rare occurrence for why kids don't come to school. Just trying to punish the family because the kids aren't going, especially in high poverty environments, doesn't have any impact, um, and it ends up wasting a lot of resources. That's why we're seeing growing numbers of uh, juvenile justice efforts and uh, local judges really moving away from a punitive truancy approach to one that tries to have a problem-solving um, you know, improvement contract approach Again, directly trying to have a positive way to solve the problem, not sort of a punishing attitude. Um, at a district level, to be organized, this is a, a this comes from our friends at attendance work, and it's a very, I think, a very powerful diagram of how to create uh, a district framework to support a multi-sector approach. You got to have actionable data that's available to all the players in, in the in the multi-sector effort, not just the schools, but the health providers. Um, the housing folks working on it, if they don't have access to that attendance data, they can't mobilize their efforts to the right kids, the right places. We have to have capacity building um, across all sectors. Chronic absenteeism has been around forever, but it's only recently been recognized and addressed, and so it's often a new skill and a new wheelhouse for people, and we've got to build that up. We need to build these strategic partnerships. As we said, schools can't do it alone. I and mean, with a sense of shared accountability, right? If it's a community problem, the whole community, the whole multi-sector has got to have be, be, be seeing how, what impact are you having on improving the kids' attendance. Um, and then again, as we've said uh, before, but you can't say too often, this idea of positive engagement. 
of really building the caring relationships, the effective messaging, the positive school climate to make school a welcoming place. Um, that gives us sort of a framework for how we can organize this multi-sector approach at the district level. And then finally, we have the state level. Um, and again, this comes from our friends at Attendance Works. Um, they've done a lot of good work at the state level. And if you were able to see the chronic absenteeism presentation, um, one of the large plenaries that were done yesterday, but is available at the, at, at the uh, National Student Attendance Engagement and Success Center um, to be watched, uh, you know, archived, to be watched again if you missed it the first time. Um, representatives from the state of Connecticut are there, and they have one of the strongest state-level uh, multi-sectored multi efforts. Um, and this really, is, this, this diagram shows this idea of creating sort of uh, practice through peer learning, groups of, of districts and so forth learning together and sharing their learnings, supported by some TA and some policy changes at the state and some training efforts, um, is really a way to build that multi-sector and multi-tiered effort at the state level. And again, I really encourage you uh, to visit Attendance Works and also that plenary session where you can see the really great case example of Connecticut and how they put these pieces together. With that, I, I thank you for participating, and we're going to now uh, hear some answers to, su to some of the questions you sent in. Hi, I'm Robert Balfance from the National Student Attendance, Engagement, and Success Center, and I'm here to answer some of the questions you sent in for this session. Our first question, we are tracking chronic absence as a state and at the local level. How can we support strategies that will accelerate results? So we really know there's four key things that need to happen at the school level to really move chronic absenteeism, and they can be supported at both the state and the district level. First of all, we have to monitor chronic absenteeism on a regular basis and as close to real time as possible. And we need to do it at the grade level. So we really make sure that, so make sure that's happening and make sure the schools have ready access to their data. So on a regular basis, weekly or biweekly, they can look at trends and patterns to see who's chronically absent, who's trending towards chronically absent, who's getting better and exiting chronic absenteeism. That's the first thing. Then we have to be able to react to the level of chronic absenteeism we need. And it usually involves creating some sort of mentoring or adult connection system for the kids with a prior history of chronic absenteeism, where they know there is someone in the school that's missing them every day they're not there, that's calling them when they're not there, that gets to know them, that encourages them, and leverages that relationship to understand the root cause of why they're not coming. Then we need sort of a problem-solving capacity. We need a way to say, what assets do we have in our school and our district that we can bring to bear against these issues that we find are surfacing, whether they be outside of school, in school, or types of student disengagement that are keeping students from school? How do we align the resources we have against the emerging patterns we see? We then also have to work to involve our youth serving and support agencies in a more integrated way, have them participate in some of these weekly or monthly data review meetings so we can have much better interaction with the folks that have capacity to deal, deal with things like housing issues or health issues or safety issues. And then finally, we need to really make sure we always create that positive, welcoming school climate where kids want to be every day, where parents feel welcome. We don't want to get into a thing where we're sort of yelling and shouting and blaming people or making them feel unwelcome when they're late to school or if they miss a day. We don't want to be sarcastic. We really want to have that sort of proactive, positive attitude. We want you in school. We're here to help you and figure out how to get you here every day. What practices are in place to work with families whose students are chronically absent? So a number of things have been tried in multiple districts. New Britain's a good place to look. Um, there are some others where they really take a, a, a couple-pronged approach. One is that welcoming environment we've heard about. Um, secondly, it is sort of proactive messaging to parents to make them understand that every day matters and that that just missing two days a month, which might not seem like a lot, adds up to, to 20 days in chronic absenteeism in the year. We know from uh, studies that parents tend to underestimate how many days their kids have missed almost by half. So giving them good, accurate, neutral information on their kids' attendance on a regular basis and the importance of daily attendance has been shown to have some pretty strong impacts. And then it's also just trying to understand what are the factors preventing parents from getting their kids to school every day, whether it be transportation, or other issues, and then trying to solve that at more of the system level. We currently have a tiered attendance intervention pyramid built, but 
but are still looking for ways to recognize students whose attendance has improved. So one of the things we've clearly seen over time is that social recognitions are the most powerful. Kids of all ages crave adult recognition, even though they may not seem like it, especially as they get older. Um, and so things just like most improved homeroom, uh, students that have made significant improvement over the last two weeks, uh, students that um, have had maintained good attendance, you want to sort of recognize all those variants of sort of good attendance and improvement. Simple things like putting their picture on the wall in a, in a place of sort of celebration for the school, having shout outs on the intercom, um, you know, having group celebrations for the most improved homeroom. Those things go a long way, they don't cost anything, um, and they tend to have more staying power than just pure sort of material incentives. So it's really just that recognize we want you here every day, we recognize it may be hard for you to come every day, we're really giving you encouragement and shout outs and recognition when you're able to make that effort and solve those problems and be there every day. How can we get city and state officials to write legislation around attendance? So, you know, a couple things to keep in mind here. One is you want to make sure it's good legislation and not bad. You want to make sure it is that positive, proactive, problem-solving approach and not a punitive, uh, let's, let's crack down. People think that's the answer, but the evidence shows it doesn't make it better. Um, it often makes it worse, and sometimes it gets to the point of almost criminalizing um, being poor. So what we really want is, and Connecticut has some good example of this. They have some good recent legislation that really established that that they would have a common definition of how they measured chronic absenteeism in the state, that they would monitor it and districts would monitor it, and the districts that had high rates of chronic absenteeism would come up with action plans. So I think if you want to look at, for a place that's had good legislation, like the Connecticut, um, and from that you sort of have to encourage and find sort of the groups, the advocacy groups, the parent groups, uh, the folks that can sort of get their legislature's ear and sort of be the conduit for that legislation. But the key thing is really give them examples of positive and effective legislation and not legislation that sort of pushes uh, against the evidence we have of what we know matters and helps improve attendance. How can states support a multi-tiered approach to chronic absenteeism? So uh, our friends at Attendance Works, and I, rec I uh, uh, direct you to their website to find the best examples and also the uh, presentation given uh, today, or yesterday, sorry, at our virtual convening on chronic absenteeism has representatives from Connecticut, um, as well as some information from California and other places on what good state efforts have been. Broadly speaking, states should have public awareness campaigns of what chronic absenteeism is and why it matters. They should establish a standard definition of what chronic absenteeism is across the state, um, using either the 10% uh, idea of missing 10% of days of schooling, um, because that lets you be much more proactive in your intervention. You don't have to wait till a certain threshold is reached to trigger action. It's when it lets you know if our students trending towards being chronically absent, if by November they miss 10% of school. Uh, you want to produce and share chronic absenteeism reports uh, by district grade and subgroup. You want to link this to your longitudinal systems where you can. You want to make addressing chronic absenteeism part of your school improvement strategies. That's a critical way. You will not improve your schools if your kids aren't there every day to benefit from the improvements. You want to support capacity building around both understanding data and best practices and combating chronic absenteeism. And you want to, where you can, build those peer networks of districts so they can learn from each other um, and not feel so isolated in this work. How can we get help to these kids more quickly? So this really gets back to the idea of using that close monitoring. And, and there's two groups of kids that you really want to be able to move quickly on. It's kids that are trending towards chronic absenteeism in a given year. That, that, that example of it's November and they've missed six days. That may not seem like so much yet. But if that continues, they're on the path to miss a month or more for the school year. So by using that close tracking of not just hitting a threshold, but a percent of school days, you're able to move much more quickly. So that's, that's one key way to, to do it. The other group that's, that you'll pick up from that that's very important to deal with in this sort of being very proactive is the kids that do not have a prior history of chronic absenteeism but have just become chronically absent for the first time or even trending towards it. That tells us that something recent has happened to change their patterns. Something has happened outside of school to make it harder to get to school. 
something has happened in school they're now trying to avoid, um, or they've, they've picked up signals that being in school every day is not important. But it's recent, right? Because all their prior history has been to have good attendance. So that's a group of kids where you can likely make very effective difference if you have that strong relation with them, relationship with them. They feel a sense of trust with an adult or adults in the school. They can help explain what's going on and you can act upon it because it hasn't been going on for years and years. Well, often in case when, that, when that's true, it's harder to disentangle because there's been both the issue itself and dysfunctional responses to the issue and it becomes a multi-dimensional multi thing. But when kids have just become chronically absent or trending towards it, that's sort of like that golden hour in medicine when you perhaps can have your greatest impacts if you're both monitoring it closely enough and have built that relationship trust so you can sort of understand what's going on. If you have not built that relationship, it's gonna be difficult just to go up to that kid that no one feels like, no one knows me, no one cares, and say, hey, why aren't you coming to school? Like, you're not gonna get the real story right away. So it's really monitoring the data and having that trust in the bank really lets you be very proactive when you see something has changed to make the student suddenly become chronically absent. What role can CBOs play in the response? CBOs have a very important role to play in a multi-sector, multi-tiered approach to combating chronic absenteeism. Um, at one level, they provide the source of the person power needed when you have a significant chronic absenteeism problem. You need to build those relationships with 50, 70, 100, 200 kids. You're not gonna be able to do that without community-based organizations. We've learned that through our success mentoring effort, which you can learn more about in the third plenary that was given in this virtual convening. And I really encourage you to go see that um, online. It gives a really good example of a really powerful community-based organizational role in providing success mentors. Um, another role they can play, and this comes from our friends in the New York City community school effort, where they have the CBO really play an organizing role in some of those data review meetings. Um, they can help sort of be the person in the building to help organize that data and present it and help support the principal and the leadership team in using it and also be the one to bring in those community-based, those other uh, youth-serving agencies uh, when needed so they can be part of the dialogue when kids have these sort of uh, higher intensity needs that need to be meet, met by outside youth service providers. So those are some of the key ways that CBOs have a really an essential role to play. And we also, um, in the after school space, is another key place where they can play a critical role by both providing the things that engage kids and make them want to come to the school day to be an after school, and then also using that to build the relationships and the trust to sort of encourage them and stress the importance of being in school every day. How do we help schools and districts build a response framework? Are there examples or models available? Sure, so in, in, the, in the PowerPoint today, um, there were some good visual models that are really based on uh, things districts have done and used. Um, and again, you can, Attendance Works website will direct you to some of those districts. Um, but I'm gonna give you a simple idea here, which is to really just create a grid that, that says, you know, what are we doing whole school? What do we have targeted? What do we have intensive in terms of the responses we're doing when kids don't come? And you can even break it into kids that have sort of severe chronic absenteeism, kids that have moderate chronic absenteeism, and kids that are trending towards chronic absenteeism. And just chart out what prevention strategies do we have? What targeted strategies do we have? What intensive strategies? That's the first step. Not too hard. The next step is where it gets, the rubber hits the road. Go back to each of those and ask yourself, is it sufficient for the number of kids that are in that bucket? And do you have any evidence that it's effective? If it's not sufficient, then you have to think about how you can increase capacity. If you don't have evidence of effectiveness, that's where that mo regular monitoring comes in. Start monitoring which interventions you're using for which type of chronically absent kids, and check back in a month and see if their attendance has gotten better. If their attendance hasn't gotten better, that tells you that's actually not an effective strategy, even though it's one that's been, you know, is part of the school's repertoire. So it's really by that simple model of saying, what are we doing in each of these tiers? What do we, is it at the right scale and intensity for the challenges we actually have? And do we have evidence that it's effectiveness? If you do that over time, you will build a very powerful locally based response system tailored strongly to the needs of your kids. How can mentoring programs be a part of the solution? Well, mentoring is really the essential part that we said is that key thing of building up that trust between the adult 
and the student, and also the sense of giving the students a sense that somebody wants them in school, misses them when they're not there, notices, and, and that's really a draw for them to be there. And this really, again, relates to the, su the success mentor effort as one of the most established mentors of that, as well as mentoring the organization mentor. Um, is another great place to check their website. They have a lot of evidence-based mentoring programs and specific work on how to use that to address chronic absenteeism. Um, but essentially the core idea of why mentoring matters is that kids come to school because they know somebody cares. That's part A and part B is because you have that relationship, you can get a better understanding of the real reasons they're not coming. And that's very important because we don't know the real reason. Our interventions will misfire or in the worst case may make things work. And when you have many kids chronically absent without some sort of mentoring program, and I think you staff from the school can be mentors, cafeteria workers, security guards, all the adults in the building can do this, as well as outside CBOs to create enough person power so that every kid that's chronically absent has that adult in their corner looking out for them, encouraging them to come, and helping them problem solve when they can't be there. How is local agency incorporated into this multi-tiered approach? We currently have parents that think, so what, when they call their child in? So there's two parts to that answer. One is that we do have to continually educate parents on the importance of coming to school every day, particularly when kids are young, right? There's often a feeling that pre-K, even kindergarten, is sort of like daycare. It's okay to miss a lot of days because it's just a happy place where kids are safe. But critical learning is happening during those times, and consistency matters for developing important behavioral norms and abilities and, and cognitive skills. And it's just letting parents know that regular attendance matters at all times, and that regular attendance in pre-K and kindergarten really helps their kids lay the foundations that will make them strong readers by third grade um, and successful in school. And so it's letting parents know that that's true. It's having that positive outreach to them, not in a blame way. Many of these parents are juggling a lot of things, multiple jobs, uh, trying situations and really providing a good home for their kids. And sometimes they're working shifts that don't even have the home in the morning when the kids have to go to school and it's a sibling getting kids to school. Um, so have some empathy for that and a sense of outreach and support um, and a sense of welcoming. And along with that pure information of why it matters, and again, there's been really, progress has been done with uh, positive messaging and different types of messaging and sending the right letter home can make a real difference. We've often, too often said a punitive letter, do this or else, or you're in trouble, um, or it's an automated voice on a phone that's got no warmth or connection that's sort of scolding you. Um, so it really is about making that positive outreach and giving the clean information of why it matters and being consistent about that. Um, and if you do that, you will see a big change in parent agency. We are part of a decentralization of charter schools. How do we implement systems that talk to each other when students are transitioning between schools throughout the academic year? So this is a problem that's not just faced by a decentralized charter system, but but schools and districts with high mobility in general. And there's been a number of places uh, that have started using like cloud-based uh, storage and things like that with the appropriate security, where the data is sort of always there and with the right access code, uh, you can always get that data. Um, and I think we have to keep moving towards systems like that. I know there are security concerns, but there are folks that have also solved some of those concerns. To really think about if we can have data easily accessible in the rest of our life outside of school, um, as we move around in our mobile, um, we can, there's gotta be ways we can do that with sort of basic information about students' attendance uh, and their health records and things like that, that, that um, really help you understand what their needs are and what we can do uh, to get them in school every day. One last question. What can be done to reduce chronic absentee rates with limited resources and no external support? So that's the power a lot of what we've been saying. Sure, there are cases where more resources will make a big difference, and there are too many of our schools that are just don't have the resources to meet the challenges they face. But at the end of the day, this is about, as we said in the webinar, is about measure, monitor, and act. It doesn't cost anything to measure chronic absenteeism. It's attendance is recorded every day at the school, and it's sent home on the report cards at a quarterly basis. It's about just reporting the data that's collected already in a different way to let us know how many kids are attending regularly and how many kids are not. It doesn't cost money to set up a group of adults that every two weeks come together for an hour to look at that data. 
sure you have to make choices of how you spend that hour, but that will be a very powerful use of that hour. Um, and it doesn't take any money in the end of the day to create an internal success mentor program where the adults already in the school each take one or two or three kids that are chronically absent. They already come across in some form already in the school day based on the grades they teach or the subjects they teach. Make the effort to get to know those kids, to welcome them when they see them in the morning, to encourage them to come the next day, to send them a text, the parents a text if they're not there. Um, that doesn't take money. Um, and if you did those things and then just work to do better coordination with existing youth agencies that exist and then use things like the climate tool that's provided uh, by the uh, Office of uh, Safe and Healthy sc Schools and Students, um, you can do a lot um, without spending any money and make a real difference. Thanks, Bob. Thanks. Thank you. Hi everyone, we're going to start with a live Q&A with Linda. Uh, so if you have any questions, please put them in the chat function and we will read down the list. Linda, we have one question for you as of now. It's from Brian and he would like to know, what is a good data gathering tool? Thanks so much, uh, Brian. First, I want to apologize to everyone for our technical difficulties. And as Dontel said, assure you that we will send a link so you'll be able to um, hear the, um, the actual audio to the questions that were um, pre-recorded. So I think that the data tool really depends on the state or district. Um, the states and districts are at such varying different places. Um, with how they are re recording their early warning system data um, for attendance behavior and for course, of course performance. So first and, and foremost, it, it kind of depends on what gives you actionable um, real-time data that can translate into school teams being able to use that data to respond to student needs. Um, there's not a particular um, platform that we would recommend. I think it's really starting out with um, thinking about what do you have currently in place? What kind of um, data would you want to mine? What levels of the IT supports would be um, at the district level? What uh, supports would be at the building level? And then what would be at the state level? And then building from there. Linda, we have a question from Ryan. He would like to know, when dealing with families with multiple students in different grades with chronic absenteeism, what are some good strategies? Wow, yeah, that's a really, that's a really powerful um, question. And, you know, I think we've been hearing a theme across all of the um, presentations, and that is that we're really trying to come from a strength-based strength and solution-oriented um, response. So really having the opportunity to interact with a family to try to find out what is the actual um, root cause of the challenge. You know, oftentimes if there's um, multiple students in, this, in the same family, you know, we don't know. It may be a transportation issue. It may be something that we need to, to um, en enlist the support of. Um, inner agencies, um, which is why a lot of the initiatives we try to have partnerships across and beyond just the, um, the school. And then sometimes thinking about um, also what is, the, what is their perception of what their children's attendance is. Um, oftentimes uh, we've found that parents don't necessarily understand that if a it, a, a child or all of their children are missing a day here or a day, a day there, um, that that really adds up. And so there's some great parent materials, parent-friendly materials on the website Absences Add Up. It's absencesaddup.org. Um, that might be a good place to start. Thank you, Linda. Brian would also like to know, uh, well, he says, we use student refusal assessment to try and dig down to the root cause. Is there any other way or product that we can do this? You know, a lot of times it's kind of five whys. 
you know, if you can if you can start with that first why and then and then push and drill down, you know, it's not a sophisticated um, technical tool, but actually, you know, kind of a interaction with the kid and the family and really just pushing down on those whys, um, old school root cause, but definitely. Um, helps to give a deeper understanding of what the challenge is. And then again, also, you know, kind of understanding there are things that, that at the school level that pull kids in, and there are things at the school level that push kids out. And so trying to understand are there any things at the, um, at the tier one level that we might look at to see um, are they causes that might be barriers or aversions, not just for individual students, but maybe whole um, subgroups of kids? Thank you. Patricia Grasick says, I'm wondering how we can hold other sectors accountable to address the issue of chronic absenteeism. Schools are held accountable and funding is based on ADA rates. What can be done to ensure that other sectors contribute their support as is needed? Oh, wow, well, that's a great question as well. So one of the initiatives that you may have heard quite a bit about uh, over the presentations across um, yesterday and, and today um, was the Success Mentor Initiative, the My Brother's Keeper Success Mentor Initiative. And that is modeled after a citywide uh, interagency approach. So if you, um, at the end of the session, when, when we send the archive link, I'll also send the link to the uh, New York City Attendance Initiative, Attendance and Truancy Initiative. And really, that's where they began, and that's where the MBK uh, Success Mentor model began. And that whole idea was um, the mayor bringing together people from um, the housing agencies, people from public health, uh, people from social services, and the superintendent at the same table to look at how might we work together. And across the um, 30 districts at very differing levels, the uh, My Brother's Keeper Success Mentor Initiative districts, those citywide convenings um, continue to happen and, and to um, to come together around the data and look at just as we do resource mapping at a school level, how might we do resource mapping at a city level so that we can get the services um, cross agency to students, parents, families, and communities that need them. It would be interesting to know if any of that work has begun. I'm not sure um, who the last the last question um, came from, Jane. But it would be interesting to know, Jane, is any of that happening at in at your um, city level already? Is or is there already a space and a place for um, the mayor who is bringing together those agencies with the schools? So that question was actually submitted by Patricia, oh, who responded to your question saying, so engaging local elected officials sounds key to ensuring that other sectors are held accountable. This has been coming not so much from a mandate perspective as a how can we bring people around, around the table to um, engage in problem solving and action planning um, together. So not not coming from a place of um, you know how can we make you do this, but just just kind of also is that same strength based problem solution oriented space that we are uh, encouraging schools to be at with schools and families, which is you know let's unearth the problems and see what might we do. And we've had a great deal of success across, as I said, um, a, a number of the. Um, MBK cities, and many of them have the have um, posted on their websites a variety of the uh, cross sector convenings that they are doing. Um, if you were to to Google it, um, I know Philadelphia, uh, Cleveland, Columbus. There's there's many others. Detroit, um, but that might be a good place to get some good ideas about how they are are having their initial convenings to bring the right people to the table. 
Thank you. Jane Boyack would like to know, are there sample surveys available for the climate survey that Bob mentioned to measure reasons for non-attendance? Okay, and I'm not I'm not sure what survey you have mentioned. I do know we just learned about a week of um, climate surveys that are going to be available to the Department of Education free of charge. And they will be included when you get the archived webinars um, from the national convening. You will see they they were um, provided in session four, um, and it uh, is coming out of the Office of Safe and Healthy Students, and it's a whole suite of climate um, surveys that are being provided free of charge. Thanks, Linda. Rebecca Rogers asks, when a district implements a tiered support system and digs deeper into data and responds appropriately, how much are they generally able to move the needle in terms of reduction of chronic absenteeism, at least at first? Well, we have, we have found um, across, first of all, Drawing attention, drawing attention uh, moving folks' mindsets just from average daily attendance at school level to looking at individual student um, data and looking at students with chronic absentee, chronic absentee indicators. Um, it's just a, it's a new way of looking at things. We do have some research right now from um, the New York City work. I'd have to, I don't have it off the top of my head to be able to tell you what is the percentage. I can tell you that it's, it, that it's significant, um, but I don't have the, the exact numbers in front of me. I'm very sorry. We'd be happy to provide those, though, after the webinar. We have any questions from Bernadette. She asks, well, she says, we have implemented an intervention check, uh, checklist at the school level to help schools document the work they have already done. This paperwork is then submitted to the court when filing for truancy. It gives the schools a voice in the court and also gives the court process a better look at what else might need to be done prior to being punitive, i.e., we court order treatment plans which were not followed prior to court. Thank you for sharing that. So, so what you're doing is making sure that even if you can't have a presence, they can have an under, a better understanding, kind of that, um, what we were just talking about, understand the challenges. So rather than go to punishment, try to figure out how can they help with perhaps, um, it, perhaps the prior intervention was the wrong intervention or the prior um, recommended course of treatment you know, for whatever reason, wasn't the right match. So um, it sounds like you've got a way to try to make sure that, that you're having a voice and advocating for there being a better view so that we can get to a better solution. I have a question from Leticia White. She'd like to know, any strategies on getting school employees, teachers, aides, et cetera, and district administrators all on board for the push to um, combat chronic absences? Some see it as more work and don't want to add it to their current workload. Ideas on getting everyone on the same page within school, uh, school sites and at the district level. That is such a great question. So in thinking about how we as humans look at things that um, that we see as additional work, um, oftentimes we kind of see things in silos, but each of those stakeholder groups that, um, Leticia, that you called out and mentioned, you know, all have on their plate in some way um, metrics that they're being held accountable to, right? They're being held um, accountable for student success, uh, maybe on state indicators, maybe on a variety of indicators. So how do we begin to message so that some of it is common sense, right? If our kids aren't in school, um, they're not going to be successful. Um, and sometimes it's about how do we frame the math? Many of the sessions you may have engaged in yesterday and today were really about helping us to take a look at and realize 
wow, what looks like one or two days of school in, in a month really ends up to a student missing 10, 20% of school. So helping people to see that frame so that they see, a, see looking, looking at attendance um, data and coming up with root causes is a solution to a problem they already have as opposed to additional work um, would definitely be helpful. We find as much as attention has been given to um, attendance at school, schools still, still very much, administrators, um, teachers, are very much of the mindset of this idea of the average daily attendance number. And so helping people to see that that average daily attendance number is hiding a whole population of kids that are, are really and truly uh, waving their hands for help. So I, I, guess, I guess that's a long way of saying, you know, knowledge is power and sharing the things you're learning and understanding about the significance of attendance and on what the trajectory of that is on a, a young person's life, on what building metrics are that in, in the long run everybody is going to be held accountable for. Um, you know, certainly would, would be a good place to start in, in helping people to be on board. I think so many times um, when I'm at schools, many, many people are not aware there's a problem because they are really connected to that number. Oh, we have 96% daily attendance, we're good. Oh, I see Brian says it's it seems as though we're waiting until a failure occurred until we do something. So, you know, I just want to say that's such a good and powerful point. And that is the idea of having a tiered system, right? If you think about it, at the, at the tier one level, tier one is all about creating an environment that is welcoming and inviting and relevant to students, right? So that's that whole idea before there's ever, before there's any problem or any challenge, are we creating a, a safe, healthy, inviting space for students? Then the idea of coming together as a team and looking at data and specifically having um, systems in place so we flag kids when they're, when they immediately are at a space where they have that first chronic absenteeism indicator, they first miss 10%, uh, um, they're at a 10% uh, missing days of school, then we're trying to get those uh, interventions immediately. Because you know, if you've missed 10% of school in the first 20 days, that's a small number, right? And it's easier to recover than it is if we're looking at it like if we're looking backwards on a year. So definitely it's a proactive system, a way of having a system that's letting us know right away who, who, who has an early warning indicator and when, um, when does it occur. And then quasi-immediate response to it. Thank you, Linda. We have a question from Patricia Grasick. She'd like to know, school psychologists, school social workers, and school counselors also work closely with the students with chronic absenteeism, especially those with social emotional behavior needs and typically are members of their school student support teams. Sorry, comment, not a question. Yeah, that's really, that's really a powerful comment. Here's, the, here's what sometimes we, find, we, we see to be true. Sometimes those folks have information that may not necessarily um, be filtering its way to all of the adults who interact with students. And sometimes that um, just having a, a, a system in place so that that does happen, you know, helps to, um, helps to have everybody working in the behalf of the student. So Bob often gives this example um, from New York City, and it, it was a, a high school that we worked with there, and it was a, a rather seasoned teacher who really um, was kind of um, disgruntled with a young man um, because he would be at school, and she would know he was at school, but he would cut her class. 
and I as a former middle and high school teacher uh, will own that, you know, that can be, um, you can take that personally. <laughs> you can go to that space. It's possible to do. And so the teacher was really, didn't have a lot of empathy for, for this student um, because they missed a lot of class and they hadn't submitted a lot of work. And so they, they kind of were like, well, you know, that's on them. And here what happened when they started, when that school started to have early warning indicator meetings and have people at the table, powerful people like um, uh, the participant that, that just shared the comment, like the counselors and the psychologist and all of the people on the support team, well, one of those people shared, um, they knew what was going on. That young man was taking his, I think it was his uncle or his grandfather, to chemo. And so he was taking him, and then he was coming into school late, and he was, didn't want anybody to find out because if they found out, you know, he was afraid that they would not allow him to do it anymore. All of that to say that oftentimes, you know, if we don't have all of the information, then sometimes we form our own conclusions, and sometimes those conclusions are wrong, and sometimes our responses then are the wrong responses. And that can be whether they're, whether they're solution-oriented or punitive. Thank you. We have a question from Brian. Um, Brian says, it seems that we need to get data from all students past and present who have attendance issues. How can we compile this information and be proactive rather than waiting until the student has an issue? I think you already addressed that one. Um, you know, I, I think he's talking about, though, like, you know, it's about a full time. And you think about the game tape they watch before they play another team. If they spend an eon of time on that, right? Well, one of the one of the the ideas that responds to what um, Brian was saying is, you know, you have an entering class every year, so I, it's a really powerful idea. What Brian is sharing is is identifying the kids that have chronic absenteeism indicators from the previous year before the school year even begins, and then looking at what, what might we start that's proactive. And all of our success mentor schools um, across the 30 districts, that is one of their best practices, is they do, when the school year begins, they begin with a list of, um, students that had a chronic absenteeism indicator from the previous year, and those kids are assigned to a success mentor. Um, I also wanted to, I know we're running out of time, but I also just wanted to, um, uh, if you don't mind, Dontel, if you would read Pamela's com comment, because it really is powerful. Pamela's comment to everyone. Yep, Pamela says, our leaders were shocked when we presented chronic absenteeism data once they saw the statistics from attendance work, awaiting our students, they wanted to make changes. Everyone needs the data from the top to the bottom. As you said, knowledge is power. It is also motivating. Yeah, that, that's inspiring. Thank you for saying that. Was there any, um, any, anything else you wanted to say, Linda, before I go into the closing remarks? Yeah, just to thank everybody, again, deepest apologies about the audio, but thank you for your perseverance and persistence. Thank you for everything that you are doing and being the voice at your district uh, and state um, and community level. Um, you are making a difference, and we appreciate everything you do. Thank you, and thank you everyone for attending today. We hope you found it helpful and informative. Uh, we'd like to invite you to, to attend upcoming events that we'll be, we'll be having and stay connected to the center. We will send a link to the recorded webinar in the coming weeks. And before you leave, please make sure you complete the poll questions that will be on the screen in just a moment.